our scripture reading for tonight is found in Romans, the eighth chapter. Uh, I will commence my reading at verse 31. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withdraw his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, will distress, or persecution, or fame, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The grass withered and the flowers thereof faded away, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, God, we come to you on this, this last night of our revival. God, we thank you for being faithful to us on Monday night. And God, we thank you for being faithful to us on last night. God, we come anxiously waiting on tonight for a word from you. We know that you're going to give us exactly what we need. We thank you, God, for this place called Shallow. God, we come here, we, we want to remove all the things that we believe we have to hide behind. And in our most vulnerable state, oh God, we want to stand before you. Asking you, God, to search us and not only search us, oh God, but remove those things from us that, that is contrary to your will. God, we thank we, we thank you that you sent the messenger to us. Continue, God, to use her for your service. We pray, God, that the words that she say on tonight, let it be preached with, with conviction and clarity, power, God, and persuasion. Because, God, we know that we can't live this life without you. God, we've tried it our way so many times, and each time we failed. So we come tonight giving it all over to you. Whatever it is, oh God, that you would assign our hands to do, give us the strength to do it, oh God. If mountains stand in our way, give us strength to climb. If valleys be in our midst, give us strength to cross over. Whatever it is that we need, God, equip us as our prayer on tonight. Dear God, we know that there may be some people in this building on tonight who may not know you, oh God, the way that we know you. Oh God, I can tell them that this journey hasn't been an easy one. But living for you, God, you made it worthwhile. You made it worthwhile for us, oh God, because you gave us your darling son, Jesus. <laughs> he died for our sins, oh God. 
we thank you, O oh God, that because he died for us, we now have the right to eternal life. So you've kept your promise to us, O oh God, so many times before. And we know now, God, that you won't come short of your word. So move in this place on tonight is our prayer. Set this atmosphere for atmospheres. Praise, O oh God. Be with us every step of the way. God, we thank you for our pastor, oh God. Continue, oh God, to stand up in him, oh God, and be, be the God that he needs for the journey. We pray, God, that you continue to bless his wife and her family as they're dealing with this time of bereavement, oh God. Let them find comfort in you, oh God. There's other families, oh God, dealing with the same time of bereavement, oh God. We have members, oh God, on our sick and shuttling list, members in the hospital, oh God. All of us need you in many different ways, oh God, and we, we're thankful, oh God, that you can meet each and every one of our needs. <laughs> because you've done it so many times before. So God, we pray on tonight. We pray on tonight, God, that you continue to be God and God alone in our lives. Bless us all as we heal, God. Bless us as we continue to strive to be the people you've called us to be. Because the end of all this, oh God, we know that you prepared a place for your prepared people. <laughs> you said in your father's house there are many mansions. Then you're coming back to receive us into your own. God, I pray that I live just a little good enough to take my room, oh God. And at that time, I get to live with you for eternity. I pray this prayer in the name that's above every other name. <laughs> at that name, every knee shall bow. <laughs> at that name, demons tremble. I pray this prayer in the sweet name of Jesus. In the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, stand on your feet and give God some praise. Come on, it's not a funeral. Come on, stand on your feet. Come on. One, two, one, two, ready. Amen. If you confess, if you confess the Lord, call him up. Oh, if you confess, if you confess the Lord, call him up. Oh, if you confess, if you confess the Lord, call him up. Oh, if you confess, if you confess the Lord, call him up. Guess what? Guess what? If you believe, if you believe in the Father, the Son, oh, and the Holy Do 
make me more like like a you 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 Wash me through and through. Just create in me a Like only you can, Lord, change, change me. Do it for me, Lord, change me. Whatever's not like you, Lord, I want you to change me. Change me, change me. Lord, I want you to
ministry of our YAM praise team and our YAM, YAM ensemble. We're ready now to receive the word of the Lord. We thank God for Dr. Callahan. We thank God for the two very timely messages, the very powerful and inspiring messages that she has brought to us thus far on Monday and Tuesday evening. And we're waiting now to hear what the Lord has placed upon her heart to share with us tonight. We ask that you would pray with her and pray for her, that the Lord might use her as he sees fit. Me now, my Savior. Hallelujah. What a privilege it is to be in the house of God for this third night of Spring Revival, also known as Holy Week Revival, also known as the Road to Renewal. What a blessing and privilege it is to have been here these last two nights. Thanks be to God for this season. Thanks be to God for the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. Thanks be to God for the opportunity to gather in worship. Before I begin this final sermon in this week's revival, I want um, to thank God. Thank God for the privilege and opportunity that I've had to be here with you this week. I have been so blessed. I've been so moved by the worship, so grateful for the singing of the choirs and praise teams, and so blessed by the time of fellowship in the office with the deacons and clergy, so blessed by your presence up north in Philadelphia, where I'm from. Folks don't come to revival anymore, and so um, I'm used to preaching just to pews during revivals. It's so good to see some people in the house. I thank you for the giving of your time and energy and your attention. Um, I thank God for you. And I am, I told Pastor Smith uh, as we were riding over tonight that my impression of Baton Rouge, this is my first impression of Baton Rouge and I am forever marked by a sense of your hospitality and graciousness, by a sense of your generosity, <laughs> amen. I want you to know that Pastor Fred, along with Reverend Jones, um, just everybody has treated me with the kind of kindness and hospitality that if I didn't have a daughter to get home to and a church to pastor, you wouldn't be able to get rid of me. Amen. And so I, I want you to know that um, while I, you know, I, I am ready to go home and see my folks, um, I'm not ready to leave y'all. And so I, that's, that's what hospitality will do for you. And so um, I want to thank you, Shiloh, for the way that your generosity releases your pastor um, to be generous and kind and hospitable. Thank you. I mean that sincerely and from my heart. I want to invite you to give consideration to yet another familiar passage of scripture found in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I bet you know it. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. Yes, 
anywhere I started in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it would be a familiar scripture, but I'm going to start in verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to God's self through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to God's self in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making an appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, that is Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, that is Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Would you pray with me, please? Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Speak, O oh God, to your people here at the Shiloh Baptist Church. Speak to our hearts. Tell us what we need to know. Make us aware of what we need to know so that we might do what you would have us do. And more than that, so we might become who you would have us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. 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 I want to talk to you tonight in this last night of revival from the subject on assignment. On assignment. For the past two and a half months or so, I have been contemplating and thinking about the life of one of the most effective and significant organizers in the 20th century. A woman whose life is often unheralded and whose name may not even be all that familiar. A woman by the name of Ella Jo Baker. I first heard of Ella Baker when I began to listen to the singing of an acapella group known as Sweet Honey in the Rock. They have a song called Ella Baker's Song based on the words Ella Baker spoke following the death of Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner in the freedom struggle of Freedom Summer 1964. Following their death, when their bodies were found in the river, uh, only because there were two white organizers along with Cheney, uh, Ella Baker lamented the deaths of all three of them and said, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's sons. Uh, they made that into what's called Ella Baker's song. And they said, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Uh, in recent years, I have heard the name of Ella Baker spoken by young organizers who are inspired by her small d democratic organizing vision. Uh, Ella Baker was known for or her reluctance uh, to support uh, uh, big, uh, high-standing, uh, important leaders who were good on the mic. She was known to want to empower people. And Ella Baker said that if you give people light, 
they will find the way. And young organizers nowadays, particularly in the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, have a small d democratic vision uh, for how leadership can happen. Not just one singular leader, not just one person, usually a man who's good on a mic, but uh, a, a leader full movement where lots of people have a sense of vision and assignment. Uh, part of that vision uh, they see reflected in the life and in the organizing strategies of Ella Joe Baker. And so this year, as I began to read a wonderful biography of her by the name, uh, by a person named Barbara Ramsby, I, I was struck by those things that I was expecting to see in her life. And, but more and more, as I read the story of Ella Baker, I was drawn to the fact that she had her hand in pretty much every major movement and organization of the mid 20th century. Uh, when she moved to Harlem, she worked for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, Works Progress Administration and began her work of organizing and collecting the stories of African Americans, some of them formerly enslaved. While she was still in Harlem, she worked for Walter White's NAACP, and although she had tension with Walter White, she did a lot of important organizing work, not only in the North, but also in the South. From there, she was hired as the first person uh, to be the director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, an organization that, of course, we associate with the life and ministry of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And after she left SCLC, although she was long past the time of being a student at Shaw herself, uh, she was also instrumental in the formation of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent uh, a coordinating committee. The thing that I kept wondering about with Ella Baker is how was it that someone who had her principles, which she helped to fastly throughout her life, how could someone who had her particular preoccupations, how was it that she could find herself working in all of these different kinds of organizations with their strong leaders with whom she often had battles and disagreements? How was it that she was able to make such a contribution both to the W? PA and to the NAACP and to SCLC and to SNCC, among many other organizations of the time. And finally, after reading hundreds, literally, of pages of Ransby's uh, uh, biography of Ella Baker, I finally unlocked the key to how it was that Ella Baker was able to do all that she did, even when it wasn't always exactly the way she wanted it to be. And Ella Baker said, I was never working for an organization. Wow. Wow. I always tried to work for a cause. Uh, do, you hear the, do you hear the difference between yeah. working for an organization and working for a cause? She said, I was never working. All of those organizations that she helped to found and helped to strategize and all of which she made significant contributions to, she said, I wasn't working for any of those organizations. I always tried to work for a cause and that cause was bigger than any organization. That cause, that mission, that assignment, her understanding of her reason for being in the world was more important than who the head of the organization was. More important uh, than who the head uh, of the NAACP was. More important even than the differences that she had from time to time. The arguments didn't keep her from doing the work. The difficulties didn't keep her from doing the work. The challenges didn't keep her from doing the work. And I realized, it was on page 281 of that biography, I realized that for freedom's sake, Ella Baker was willing to go the extra mile to work with people she found difficult and to work despite all of the challenges that she faced, both within those organizations and outside in the world. She had a cause. She had an assignment. 
environment. In that moment, I felt the spirit of the Lord speaking to me and helping me to understand a part of the challenge that we have in the church. A part of the challenge in the, that we have in the church is that we only want to do the work when it seems like everybody is all on the same page. We only want to do the work when it feels like everything is going exactly the way we think it ought to. If we don't win the vote, uh, then we disconnect ourselves from the organization. We'll sit in the pews, but we won't actually participate. Uh, we won't do any work uh, because often uh, we are focused. And I'm not just talking about the people in the pews. Sometimes I will confess my own self that I get distracted from the actual cause. Uh, I begin to focus on the how uh, and on the who and on the what, and I forget the why. I, I sometimes get distracted uh, and I begin to think about the people. Uh, I begin to be distracted by who showed up and who didn't show up, uh, by who gave and who didn't give, uh, by who is cooperating and who isn't cooperating, by who seems to be going along with the vision that I have and who seems to be pushing and pulling in the opposite direction. And in those moments, instead of staying focused, I sometimes get distracted. Sometimes I think I work for the St. Paul's Baptist church uh, instead of remembering that I don't work for a congregation I work for a cause yeah. Yeah. I, I work for a cause and so I invite you to consider the words of scripture uh, this evening. Uh, I invite you to remember with me the assignment that we have been given by God. The assignment that we have been given as the people of God. The assignment that we have all of us, uh, whether we sit in the pulpit or, or sit in the pews, no matter what our job title is, uh, indeed no matter even what our congregational affiliation is, uh, we all have have a cause. We are all on assignment. Uh, hear the words of the Apostle Paul who himself could have been distracted from his own assignment if he had allowed himself to be. If you know the story of Paul and the church at Corinth, you would know that there is some conflict happening between Paul and that church. Uh, there is some internal conflict. Uh, there are some folks in the church at Corinth who are actively working against the rule, the authority of Paul as an apostle despite the work that he has done in organizing the church at Corinth but despite the work that he has done in preaching to the church at Corinth there are some folks in the church who say he's an illegitimate apostle he's an illegitimate leader every time his back is turned somebody has something to say about Paul's leadership and if you read Paul you can see See him having to pull himself back uh, from getting distracted himself by the arguments uh, uh, that can happen in the church. Uh, uh, don't feel bad if you're almost distracted. It happens to the best of us. Uh, even the best of us uh, can sometimes get off course and forget who it is that we actually are. Not only does he have the internal conflict, uh, but he has the external threat. Uh, uh, the entire time he and the church at Corinth are having conflict, he's also so fighting for and running sometimes for his life. He's been beaten with many stripes. He's been shipwrecked more than once. He, he's had all kinds of troubles, been incarcerated more than once, rejected by his own people, appeals to Rome, and they arrest him too. Eventually, they execute him. He's got internal conflict and external threat. And I do believe that as much as he is speaking to the church at Corinth in chapter 5, I believe he's also speaking to himself uh, reminding himself as we sometimes need to do of how we got in this business in the first place uh, how we got in this work in the first place uh, and the first thing that he begins to do is to give uh, for himself and others a kind of job description beginning with the job title, who we are to you is ambassador 
Uh, anybody who's ever applied for a job knows that at the top of the job description comes the job title. And there are many job titles that we could have in the community of faith. Uh, uh, some of us have the job title pastor, and some of us have the job title deacon, and some of us have the job title singer, and some of us have the job title usher. But right now, I'd like us all to be in the same room, uh, understanding ourselves as having the same job title and and that job title is ambassador. Every other job title is a subsidiary of this main job title. And let me remind you a little bit about what an ambassador does. Uh, the role of an ambassador is to represent uh, a different nation, uh, a different kingdom. Uh, an ambassador is a citizen of another kingdom, of another nation who is on assignment, on the assignment for representation in, in a far sometimes and often strange country. Uh, what's important to understand about an ambassador is that by virtue of their job title, they understand where their allegiance actually lies. Uh, they may live in the United States, uh, but if they are the ambassador from France, uh, uh, their allegiance actually belongs to France. Uh, uh, they may live in the United States, uh, uh, but they, if they are an ambassador from Liberia, their actual allegiance is to Liberia. We may live in the United States, uh, but we are ambassadors from Christ. Uh, and what we ought to have uh, uh, before we pledge allegiance to anything else, uh, we need to remember that we actually are citizens of another kingdom. Uh, we belong to a different regime. We belong to a different nation. We're citizens of of another country. Uh, our kingdom is not of this world, uh, uh, but we are ambassadors uh, from the one who is sending us. Yeah. Now, part of what makes ambassadors effective uh, in, in, in former regimes, we would have known this. In, in the current uh, political administration, uh, you can be anybody and get sent anywhere and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, but in previous regimes, uh, when ambassadors are sent uh, from, uh, from governments that function properly. Uh, the ambassador actually has some knowledge of and affinity with uh, the place where they're going. Uh, they're able to speak the language in the place that they're going. Uh, how else can they represent uh, the interest of their kingdom to the place where they are? Uh, they have to be able to speak the same language, have to be able to understand similar customs. They have to be able to understand how the government works in the place where they are going. But what never happens in the life of an ambassador, an ambassador is never confused about the assignment they have, never confused about the mission they have, never confused about the cause they have. They might be working in Louisiana, but they know they represent heaven. They might be working in Pennsylvania, but they know they represent heaven. You might be working at Shiloh Mission Baptist Church, uh, but no matter what, remember that you represent your job title, our job title, our responsibility, and not just when we're in the church house, but wherever we go, it is our identity. That's the thing about being an ambassador. When you go to be an ambassador in a nation, you don't have a nine to five responsibility. Everywhere you go, any of you who ever see ambassadors driving around, they drive around in cars that say ambassador. Yeah. They live in houses that are under the flag of the nation from which they come and the rules of the house that they live in are not the rules of the nation where they're stationed but are the rules of the nation from which they come. Uh, they are safe in the house uh, uh, that belongs to the nation from which they come. What I'm trying to remind you is when you drive your car it doesn't say ambassador but that's what you are. When you go to your 9 to 5 job it might not say ambassador but that's what you are where Wherever you are, whatever you do, you never get an off day. You are an ambassador. Yeah. Help me. Help me. Help me. The job description and then follows the job title. Uh -huh. 
The ambassador's job is to represent the interest of the one who sent them. And, and sometimes, too, uh, this is another thing that we get twisted. We get confused about what the project is that God in Christ has given us. And so Paul reminds himself and the church at Corinth that in the midst of all of our internal battles and external threats, let's not forget the story that makes us us. Let's not forget that God was in Christ. Let's not forget that God, the creator of everything, took on human flesh and dwelt among us so that we could behold his glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Don't forget the story in all of the, the celebration and all of the commemoration of Holy Week. Don't forget the import of the story that God was in Christ not to condemn the world but to reconcile the world to God's self. Don't forget church that it's not our job to go out into the world and make people feel bad. That's not the call of the ambassador. That's poor representation of the one who sent us. The one who sent us wasn't afraid to sit down with sinners. Wasn't afraid to communicate with sinners. Wasn't afraid to be kind to sinners. The one who sent us came into the world to invite people to get to know God. To know that God loves us and that God has purpose for us and that God has good intentions towards us. We represent heaven poorly when we show the world meanness. We represent heaven poorly when we show the world unkindness. We represent heaven poorly when we don't show the world that God loves them and wants to reconcile them to God's self. Our entire job yes. is to speak, but not just to speak. To do the work of ministry. Uh -huh. And not just to say the words of reconciliation, but do the work, God help me, of reconciliation. Yeah. And not just say the words of reconciliation, but do the labor of reconciliation. Somebody wonders what the church has to do with social justice. A part of it is the work of reconciliation. We're showing the world. The world will never believe that God loves them if hungry people don't get fed. The world will never believe uh, that God loves them if naked people don't have clothes. Uh, the world will never believe uh, that God loves them uh, uh, when uh, uh, folks who are being treated unjustly uh, can't get an advocate uh, uh, from us. Uh, uh, the world will never believe uh, that God loves them if we don't do the work that shows them that we love them. We are ambassadors. God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. The God was in Christ, reconciling the world. But not only that, and then when we are in Christ, we are a part of God's new creation. And now any job description that's worth its salt will tell you not only what the job title is, and tell you not only what the job description is, the responsibilities that are a part of the job. Every job description rightly has to tell you who you report to. All right. All right. Here again, we frequently get it twisted. Uh -huh. uh, we get confused about who we actually report to. Uh, now let me say uh, and be very clear that I think it is important for us in every position that we occupy in the church uh, to learn how to speak to and speak with one another in ways that demonstrate our accountability. Uh, I'm not saying uh, uh, that we get to go off uh, uh, on our own and do whatever we feel like doing and when anybody asks us 
anything about it, we say only God can judge me. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, there are a lot of people, Pastor, uh, that we have to work with. Uh, there are a lot of people that we have to talk with. Uh, there are a lot of people that we have to labor with. Uh, uh, church, there are a lot of people you'll have to work with. A lot of folks uh, you'll have to talk with. A lot of people you'll have to speak with. Uh, oh, but I want you to know uh, that there's only one person who we work for. Uh, we don't work uh, uh, for one another. Uh, uh, we don't work uh, uh, for anybody on planet earth. Uh, uh, we work for the one uh, who sent us. Uh, and just as Jesus said, uh, I must work the works of the one who sent me. While it is day, uh, we too must work the works uh, of the one who sent us. Uh, while it is day, uh, who is it uh, who sent us? Uh, I heard them say earlier that the praise belongs to Jesus Jesus, 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 Jesus. And the wonderful thing about the one that we report to is that we don't have to worry about how he got the job. I know all of us have worked in organizations sometimes where we have been forced to report to people and we can't figure out how. Uh, they got the job. How is it that they got the job when they know less than we know? How is it that they got the job when they work less than we work? How is it that we have to be accountable to them when they don't do as much as we do? But I'm so glad that when it comes to the one to whom we report, we don't have to worry about how he got the job. Do you remember that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but he made himself of no reputation and took on himself the form of a servant. And when he was found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, that's why on account of that, God has hired exalted him and has given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord Lord in heaven and Lord on earth Lord in our lives and King of this kingdom His job description, his job title is Savior. And that's why he's in charge. His job title is King of Kings. That's why he's in charge. His job title is Lord of Lords. That's why he's in charge. And he is the one to whom we give account. Now, I'm almost finished. We got the job title. We are ambassadors. We have our job responsibilities, the ministry of reconciliation. We know who we give an account to, to whom we have to report. Our savior, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. But I don't know of anybody who would want to work a job. I don't know anybody who would want to have a whole list of responsibilities. I don't even know anybody who would apply for a job if they did not have some sense of what the compensation was going to be. I came to tell you uh, that God is not unrighteous uh, to forget your work and labor of love. Uh, you don't have to worry uh, about whether there's any compensation uh, as you do the work of ministry. You don't have to worry about whether there's any compensation uh, as you are on assignment. When you get sent as an ambassador, the one who sent you 
when you get sent as an ambassador, uh -huh. the one who sent you uh -huh. has responsibility for your care while you are in the foreign land, while you're in the strange land. The government that sent you has responsibility for your well-being while you're there. And when you get home, uh, you are promised uh, something special uh, for your service. Uh, I came tonight on my way home to tell you uh, that God has got you in God's care. As you do the work of ministry, uh, as you act as Christ's disciple uh, in the midst of conflict within uh, and treachery and danger without, uh, God has got you. Uh, God's got your back. Uh, God is responsible for your care. God is responsible for your well-being. And when you get home, when we get home, when we get home, God has promised, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone as according to their works. God's grace is sufficient right now and God's reward. Your reward. I know we talk about gold streets and crowns and such. But I've walked this journey of ambassadorship long enough to, to notice something about how God works. Every now and then on the journey, hallelujah, there'll be a dispatch from heaven. Every now and then on my journey, there's been dispatches from heaven. Things that wouldn't mean anything to you. Things that wouldn't mean anything to you. That God, God drops in my way and not I'm not talking about money I'm not talking about checks I'm not ta I'm talking about things that wouldn't mean anything to anybody else uh, but they are ready and tailor made to me to remind me that I am not forgotten while I am journeying through this land and so I just have to believe uh, that if God knows how to drop tailor-made surprises in my life uh, to make me know I'm not forgotten now, uh, that when it time comes for my reward, uh, that it too will be tailor-made. I'm not that interested in crown. I think God's got something for me. That, that's, I, I want to see him look on his face, but I know that I, I'm going to be excited just to see his face. But I know that it, just like every good parent knows their child. I know God knows me. And when I get home, When I get home, I believe that the reward for me will be tailor-made. I believe that the prize for me will be tailor-made. I believe that the gift for me will be tailor-made. And not for me only, but for all of those. All of us who are on assignment. What a powerful word. What an inspiring word. What an edifying word coming from this God sent preacher. And it would be a shame for all of that good seed 
to not find some fertile ground tonight. If there's some man, woman, boy, or girl who needs to recognize what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be on assignment sent from him. And if you're willing to accept the assignment 